We've done it again, guys. We've reached Friday night. So get those glasses high in the sky, pull up the stool, get close, cuddle up. We got some great books. We got some great books to talk tonight, and we're talking final order cutoff, which means only one thing. It's time for last call. Hey, what's going on guys? It is Brian and Jack with Superman's Comics. We want to take the time to say thank you for watching these videos. This is the last call show where we're talking about those books hitting final order cut off this coming Monday night. Get those orders in so that way you can guarantee your copy. And with those orders, you sometimes, a lot of times, you get discounts on the pre-orders. But we got some great books to talk about this week, don't we, Jack? Yeah, a few unconventional ones. Uh, a, few, a few things you want to be on the lookout for when you're checking out those previews this week, making your... Uh, final order cutoff picks. Right, we're going to get right into it right now with the first one that everyone's uh, well aware of, and we're talking about James Tennyon's run again with Batman number 92. Now, this one was crazy because DC did the old switcheroo. Everyone's like, oh, 94, that art germ variant's got the first appearance on the cover. But then we saw that the regular cover A of 92 actually has punchline on the cover as well. And then lo and behold, DC switches up that cover B moves that art germ variant from 94 up to 92, and we have it for final order cut off this Monday, right, Jack? Yeah, so if you had previously pre-ordered that Batman 94 somewhere with that art germ cover, you may want to follow up with them before Monday, make sure if it's that art germ cover you are chasing that you are locked in for Batman 92. Now, there was some kind of false marketing going around, trying to promote this as like a first full appearance of Punchline, but we've already seen the CGC label noting uh, Hell Arisen 3 as first full punchline. So I think at this point, that ship has sailed. Having said that, it doesn't seem to matter. The the um, heat and demand on this character right now is is really huge. And it, while we see hot first appearances seemingly pop up every few weeks, I have to admit that this is one of the biggest ones I've seen in, in a number of years, if not the biggest on immediate impact. And I think that that popularity and heat is going to carry over within this storyline, at least for the next several issues. Now, cynics are going to tell you that there's going to be a huge print run on this book, and there absolutely will be, there's no doubt. And that Archer cover is going to do a lot to drive that print run. Um, but I also think the demand will be strong for this. When you look at what the prices are going for on the previous punchline issues, you're talking about $40 a book. So even if you were to drive that way down, um, and those books were selling for seven or eight dollars a book. That would still be above cover price and worthy of a pre FOC pre order. So that's something to think about and something to be on the lookout for. But either way, even if you just want to read this book, if you're a reader, if you're um, loving this Tinian run, if you're trying to put that Batman run together post rebirth, make sure you pre order this pre FOC because I know a lot of people are going to try to tell you that this book is going to be everywhere and it's going to be readily available. But we have seen some incredible things going on in the comics market in the last uh, couple weeks around Punchline. And I wouldn't take anything to chance. Myself, I'm rather punch drunk over Punchline. And if these prices creep up like we've seen them creeping up, I'm going to take that money and I'd rather put it in that old art germ Batgirl number 12 than this Batman 92. Here's a book, just the title alone gets me excited, and it's Nailbiter Returns from Image. Nailbiter was one of my favorite series a few years back from Image Comics. Joshua Williamson writing it. We got, what, Mike Henderson on art for this. Fantastic story. Glad to see it return. What are your thoughts, Jack? Well, I, I like you, am a huge fan of Nailbiter for, for several reasons, but um, it's one of those titles that I have sat back and waited and said, why hasn't this one been uh, optioned? Why hasn't this one been adapted with everything that's gotten uh, optioned over the years? Now, that's for a few different reasons. When I got back into comics and really reading heavy, it was one of the first kind of image indie books that I started grabbing on a monthly basis and really loved. I've become a huge fan of Joshua Williamson and have since followed him through his run with Flash. Um, 
also, it's one of the early books that like, I really learned a good lesson reselling comic books because I had a big stack of them um, and they were selling for about $10. And I started to get frustrated and realizing I wasn't, um, I wasn't making enough profit. So then I held them back thinking, well, they're going to go up. And then the demand dried up for it. I didn't think we would ever get any more nail biter, but uh, it's exciting that it's coming back. I'm hoping that it revives some interest. And I hope, Brian, that there's people out there like us who are excited to read more Nailbiter. Here we have Strange Adventures number two. Now, we just talked about the first issue. It just came out this week. We talked about it on the Bolo Show. But Strange Adventures number two, it's hitting final cutoff. It has that regular cover by Mitch Drads as well as that Shaner cover B. I like this one. I like the first issue. We talked a little bit about it. You referenced Tom King with Miracle Man. I'm picking this up because I want to see where the story goes, but also just to see if it might follow that trend that Miracle Man did. Right. And I think the trend that you're talking about is the fact that, um, you know, issue number two, issue number three of Miracle Man are also, you know, sold out, gone to late printings. I, even beyond, I think, issue, I think it went until issue four or five where they were going to late printings. Uh, books were selling above cover price. You could not find that first print in stores. And again, that is a primary reason behind the last call show is if you don't get those pre-orders in and lock those books down, you're really playing uh, a game of risk with whether or not these books are going to be in stock because you got to remember, you may have seen Strange Adventures number one in stores, but orders tend to drop by 50% between issues number one and issues number two. So you will see far less Strange Adventures number two in your local comic shop then you saw strange adventures number one now you heard me talk about it on the bolo show it was my long-term play of the week it's definitely a book i'm real bullish on i really enjoyed reading it i think it's going to be i don't want to call it mr miracle part two but it, it can go down that road it has that potential we've seen preview pages for it. issue number two it looks amazing looks like we're going to get more batman we're going to battle professor pig so definitely one to be on the lookout for. Um, and again, this is why we like having this show right here on the Simple Men's Comics YouTube channel. We're going to talk about a number of books that are getting highlighted and we're making sure that you're aware of them really for different reasons. And um, this is one to be on the lookout for because those print runs do drop after that first issue. Here we have Joker, Harley, Criminal, Insanity number four. I'm going to go on a limb here and say this for me is a reader pick for me. If you haven't been reading this, I've really been enjoying it between Harleen and this one, that DC Black Label. This is the Harley that I like to read over the regular Harley title. But either way, also, this has two fantastic covers, the cover A's by Francisco Matina. And it's also got a cover B by Mike Mayhew. Can't go wrong with either of those covers either. Yeah, and Harley is seemingly everywhere right now. The Harley animated series seemed to be a pretty big hit as far as the DC Universe app is concerned. Uh, we've also got the uh, Birds of Prey movie, which didn't do that well in, in the box office. Oh, that came out already? But I have to admit, it's, it's not a bad movie. So uh, I think it's one of those ones you kind of got to give it a chance. Um, it, it's, it's, I guess, Suicide Squad, but that, I know that that's not a positive comparison. Moving from DC, getting over to that smaller press with IDW, we get Star Wars Adventures Clone Wars, but we're getting issues one through five, all hitting FOC at the first, all hitting FOC at the same time. And another thing I like about this book is it's written by Michael Morrissey. I'm a big fan of Wasted Space from Vault Comics. I'm glad he stayed in that whole space adventure and going over to Star Wars with Clone Wars. Well, I also think this is a cool opportunity for him to kind of step out of that independent creator owned realm and into that kind of like classic property even if it's done through an all ages format with idw um this is one of my big picks i think for this week if you really look at it and it, it's one to really keep an eye on first off we've seen in star wars comics are hot and yes that is the kylo ren stuff the marvel stuff definitely the more adult oriented stuff but i caution you on a couple things number one 
all ages does not mean for children. It means for all, all ages. ages. Right. <laughs> children and adults. So you're not, sometimes I feel like there's a sentiment that these are, um, you know, kitty books and that's not really the case it's really in line with honestly the the star wars movies because the star wars movies are essentially you know aimed towards all ages um so i don't really think that that there's um anything different there other than maybe like the art style is a little more rounded a little softer cartoony um but the main reason and i mentioned this earlier that we're going to be talking about books for different reasons and it's why I love this show. It's still my favorite show on the channel. It, and this is because as Brian mentioned, this is a weekly series, meaning instead of coming out once a month, it's coming out once a week. And these five issues are gonna come out in five consecutive weeks. So they're all hitting FOC at once. This is unique. You do, don't see it very often. We've seen it before. And because we've seen it before, we kind of can look back at history and expect a few kind of trends. And one of those is, you're not going to see a huge print run on this series in general because any order that somebody's going to have to put in, they're going to have to put in for all five issues. So you're looking at it and that all is hitting them at one point. Yeah. Now, these may ship week to week to week. So you're not paying for them all at once. You're paying for them every week, but you've got to put that order in all at one time and you have to gauge interest. So if issue number one comes out, and it's this smash success that everybody loves, you can't go back and get more issue two, issue three, issue four, and issue five. This is one that I can see a lot of stores just getting for their subscribers and maybe a couple for the wall. And there are incentives for all five issues, one in 10 incentives. And you know what one in 10 incentives and what IDW incentives can do on the secondary market, especially when they are ghost and it's, it, this is again Star Wars and the demand. We've seen it with the with the Vader series, the Vader Castle series. I think this one has a lot of potential. Yeah, and the good thing about this and good thing about the show is if you're interested in getting this, get those pre-orders in so that way there's still some on the shelves for the kids that actually want to read the book. And keeping with Star Wars, but moving over to Marvel, we get a brand new Dr. Afro series. This has some great covers. My favorite cover out of the bunch is that Ashley Witter variant. But either way, Dr. Afro came out of the scene of what, uh, that Darth Vader series. Huge fan favorite. A lot of people like her. Here she is with, this is her second solo series though, right? Right, second solo series. And that would usually mean, I would say this is uh, really reader only. Um, but I will caution we know that Dr. Afra has been brought up time and time again for rumors to be involved in some sort of Star Wars related Disney Plus television show. I think that these rumors are so strong and so persistent. It's one of those things that even if it wasn't true, if it wasn't already in talks, it's got to be at this point because the demand is there. And if we're going to see this character at some point, all of these Dr. Afra books become possible first appearances, possible, uh, you know, um, stories that can be drawn yeah. from i was gonna say you never know what characters might come out of it i mean look at the characters that are popping off now that came out in Sh shattered empire or the old dark horse star wars books right so like i bought all the dr afra books coming up um i was reading that series i have a bunch of variants and there was a time when maybe i didn't feel so great about that stuff you know like it, it didn't really perform um but now I, i'm kind of feeling more and more bullish about Dr. Afra as we see just looking at the trends, what her first appearance has done. There's the, there's a whole new crop, Brian, of, of Star Wars comic people getting into, into the game. I see more and more Star Wars posts on my Instagram of pickups and hauls uh, and people are picking up first appearances left and right. And I see that Dr. Afra book all the time continues to rise. So I think there's going to be more and more eyes on her and more and more attention. So we'll have to see. There was a number of store exclusives when that first series came out and they all seem to do pretty poorly for the stores that created them. Um, I think that there was a little bit of a letdown on that series, but this one, a lot less fanfare. Um, and that's kind of the type of thing that I like, the type of thing I pay attention to. What do you think? About 27, 30,000? Issue number one? Yeah. 40? 
yeah, yes, it definitely, um, definitely sub fifty. There's no way yeah. it it's not going to do numbers similar to what like Kylo Ren or Vader would do. Sticking with Marvel and moving into Marvel's pretty good with that marketing of what movies are coming up. And we got Taskmaster number one. This is a mini series that cover A has that new Mutants 87 cover swipe look to it. But what do you think about this, Jack? Yeah, I mean, I'm excited to be honest with you. Uh, Taskmaster is one of my favorites since I was younger. So I'm all on board to get to read any kind of Taskmaster focused story because there really have only been a few mini series since the character's creation. So, and Taskmaster is one of those characters similar to like Omega Red or like the symbiotes Carnage and Venom where like now Carnage and Venom have grown and become bigger than life, but where there's like a, but there's like a cult popularity to that character, right? You know, Taskmaster, people have really been waiting to see on the big screen and it took Taskmaster being the villain in the upcoming Black Widow movie for us to get this mini series, but hey, I'm not complaining. And for that reason, also, we're getting the Black Widow, uh, a new Black Widow number one on FOC, this FOC as well. We're not covering it or talking about it, but um, like you mentioned, Brian, Marvel is good at kind of timing these releases as we approach this uh, Black Widow movie release to have this Taskmaster series and a new Black Widow series kind of dropping simultaneously. I will say that Black Widow does have some nice cover artists. You got Adam Hughes yeah. tied to it. You got Jason Campbell. Um, Jason Scott Campbell, my bad, <laughs> and a couple other heavy header type artists to to go with that. But I, to me, past few Black Widow series that I've read, I haven't enjoyed as much. So that's kind of the reason we've talked about it before. We're like, ah, out of the two, we're more interested in Taskmaster. Let's put that on there. And you talk about happy to see his day in the movies. You know what made me like Taskmaster a lot more? All those animated series he showed up in. Yeah, yeah. That's absolutely what what I think a lot of people, especially like kids of a certain age, like uh, there's a certain group of, I think it's a little younger than me, where they kind of grew up on those like Spider-Man animated series, um, some of the more, the later, more modern ones. Yeah, even like, yeah, yeah, like the like Disney XD. Yeah, where, di- where Taskmaster was like the main focus, uh, fighting Deadpool, fighting Spider-Man. Um, and uh, I think that that is why... I think Taskmaster has a chance to possibly be one of those characters that kind of breaks out to the next level. Then stepping away from Marvel, moving back over to Small Press with Boom Studios, we get Mighty Morphin Power Rangers number 50. Now, not the whole issue's coming up for FOC, just one of the books, one of the variants, and it's that Jamal Campbell foil variant. And why is that, Jack? Well, yeah, this is why we have to talk about this right now, because um, issue number 50 is going to be a major issue for anyone who's into Power Rangers. So if you've at all listened to us talk about this Necessary Evil story, if you heard us talk about Shattered Grid, if you've heard us talk about um, the Ranger Slayer, if you've heard us talk about Lord Draken, if any of that interests you, if you've been taking this journey with us issue 50 is the end all be all um where we are going to wrap up this story and see where we are going next now it's interesting that this book isn't on foc yet but one of the variant covers is that is where i talk about another book that we're talking about for a different reason um this is something that is going to get overlooked just naturally because when you're looking at these preview lists like brian and i do every week when we're getting ready to record this show and you see every book because of the multitude of of variants has just a number of different entries for it and then when you get one book just kind of slipped in there and it almost seems out of place it's easy to miss it's easy to miss it's easy to forget about it's easy to not know whether or not it's going to come up next week, what the deal is. Especially with um, independent, because a lot of times the independent books you'll see on yes. FOC, like the first time, but then like they're on FOC, they're on the FOC list for like a month after. That's not the case with this book. Yes. And what we found out is that sometimes these foil treatments take a little longer to print than the typical comic book. So that's why they go on FOC well in advance. So this is something to keep an eye out for, because we know issue 50 is going to get people's attention. 
we know issue 50 is going to be talked about um, on various news sites and so on and so forth. And when it is, yes, there's going to be those variant covers that we know and love from Power Rangers. There's going to be um, that Goni Montez variant. There's going to be that Chris Anka trading card incentive. Um, there's probably going to be some dope store exclusives. But at the same point, this is the one I've got my eye on because this is kind of a unique situation. But it's not totally unique. And you know why, Brian? Because there is another Boom Studios variant just like this on this FOC. And if you were at all a fan of Faithless from Brian Azzarello, then we have Faithless 2, number one, the Chris Anka FOC variant, also on FOC this week in advance of Faithless 2 number one being solicited. Then staying with the independent small press, we're moving over to Archie here with the return of Sabrina and Sabrina Something Wicked number one. Me, I kind of see this as the same story of we were talking about the Dr. Afra series. We got a return of Sabrina, but there's some great covers for this. And there's still a little bit of heat from Netflix series. A lot of people like that Netflix series. We tend to talk about that a lot, but anxious to see how this book does. I like Archie books. It's how I got my start in comics to begin with. But either way, what do you think about Sabrina, Jack? Well, yeah, um, I, this is interesting that you mentioned that too, because I really think that similar to some of your other favorites, some of those kind of 80s properties that I know you love, Brian, uh, I've been paying attention to trends and I really think that Archie is something to pay attention to. Now, I think this book will be primarily uh, a Homer book. It's a book that Archie fans will love. This is not the Archie afterlife Sabrina or the Sabrina you see in the Netflix. This is the more traditional Sabrina. Um, having said that, I think there'll be some amazing, you get some, I think I know there's some amazing variant cover art. This is kind of like a pick your favorite, buy what you like sort of deal. There's also some great store exclusives, but the thing that I mentioned before on one of our other programs, and I want to mention again, and it's the reason I was kind of excited to get to talk about Sabrina and an Archie property, is I am paying attention to in 2020 um, pop culture in general because it affects the comic book market so much. And one of the things I noticed in checking out Toy Fair 2020, um, which just passed a couple weeks ago in New York City, and it really kind of outlines what you're going to see in retail shops as far as um, – action figures and this this impacts what what you're going to see in comic book stores what you're going to see in walmart and target what kids are going to be buying what is going to be the things that people are talking about and one of the licenses that seemed to really show up at several booths was archie uh traditional archie as well i don't know whether it's the riverdale show or the sabrina tv show or a combination or if these books are seeing a resurgence um due to nostalgia i don't know what it is but it seemed like whether it was Funko or Super 7 or NECA, everybody seemed to have their own kind of little Archie section. And they were small, but this is big. That is a, a major step up for Archie Comics, which is really a, still a, as iconic as it is, a small press independent comic book company. So I'm excited and I'm paying attention to Archie. It's something that I expect to see kind of grow over the next couple of years. And it'll be interesting to see if any more of their properties end up on whether a streaming service or a television network. Our last pick of the night, sticking with that indie, and we're sticking with probably one of the best writers in horror comics, especially when it comes to indie, especially when it comes to Oni Press, where we're talking about Cullen Bunn writing this new title called Rogue Planet with Rogue Planet number one. It's got the regular cover. It's also got a cover B by Kyle Strom. I can't wait to read this. What do you think, Jack? Well, yeah, Cullen Bunn is one of the most consistent writers, especially when you're talking about sci-fi, horror, kind of dark stories. And we talked about it, um, you and I, at Baltimore when we were actually sitting out having a few uh, adult beverages um, about how kind of consistent he is, that it's amazing that he can put out so much work and yet it stays all really kind of in that above average to really kind of awesome. Everything gets attention from the market. Everything gets talked about upon release. And he does it for so many publishers. Omnipress, Aftershock. 
Boom Studios, Image Comics. Um, he can go jump and write a Marvel book. He is absolutely like a renaissance man of comics. And uh, I really think that that gives him uh, kind of a automatic pass for me when his name pops up on the previews where it's like, I got to check out issue number one. Yeah, there's a couple like that for me. I'd say Cullen Bunn's one. Um, Ed Brubaker's another one for me. If he writes something normally, especially if it's with um, him and was it Sean Phillips? Yeah. They're doing, if they team up together, I'm usually reading it. Fantastic stories. But Cullen Bunn definitely, Rogue Planet, hitting FOC this Monday night. And with that being said, those are our 10 picks. But like we always do, Jack's going to give you the additional prints that are hitting FOC as well. That's right. Bang number one is coming to a third print. On the stump, number one is hitting a second print. We've got Mercy, number one, from Mirka and Dolfo, hitting that second print. Tartarus, number one, hitting a second print. Outer Darkness Chew, that crossover, number one, hitting a second print. And then we've got Star, number two, hitting a second print. And Ravencroft, number two, hitting second print from Marvel Comics. So there it is. Those are 10 picks. There's additional printings. If you want to see that full final order cutoff list, we're talking comic books. We're talking trade paperbacks, omnibus, statues, toys, all of it. That full list is up on civilmanscomics.com right now. Head over there and check that out. And also, one more thing. This coming Tuesday, we have episode two of Simple Man's Comics and Friends podcast, right, Jack? That's right. More hot topics, more great guests, more excellent content right here for the Simple Man's Comics YouTube channel. So make sure you subscribe, hit the notification bell if you want to watch it on video. If you want to sit, listen to it on the audio version, make you, you search Simple Man's Comics podcast wherever you find your audio podcast. And with that, this is Brian and Jack from Simple Man's Comics, and we'll see you guys in the next video.